and uh, I guess which platform, which outlets, is that correct there? Um, uh, and uh, and who, how are we going to do that? So there's lots of questions about that. So there are... Uh, do you want to introduce yourself? Um, I'm, no, but in a minute. Oh. Is, with one, are you all right to yeah, do that? Sure. Okay. Right, so we've got some journalists in the room. I'm not a journalist, I'll tell you what I am. So my name's Deborah Salvi. Um, I've been involved with disability since early childhood when I fell down the stairs, or was I pushed? Um, um, so I spent 11 years, age five to 16, in a long stay hospital, a special boarding school um, for cripples. Um, and emerged from there a bit of an institutionalised wreck. That's by way of my, if I behave oddly, that I blame it on my institutionalised childhood. So 1983 to 93, I was active um, in the peace, anti-nuclear and social justice campaigns. What campaign? Sorry? Peace. Can you say it again? Peace. Yeah. Peace campaigns. Okay. Anti-nuclear. Yes. Social justice. Yes. 93 to 1983 to 93. In 1992, I discovered the social model of disability, and I was delighted to find that disability is both a political and a social justice issue, and that's our uh, hiya. Hi, I just wanted to remind everyone, well, remind you that it was 3.15 that it was going to finish, okay. just in case, and there was a sign-in sheet that should have gone out. So what was it you reminding us of? 3.15 uh, at the workshop. Okay. Thank you. Right, so uh, anyway, this is just by way of telling you where I'm, I'm coming from. We'll pass that round in a minute. Um, disability is both a political and social justice issue, and I kind of want to keep this conversation that we're going to have rooted in that. Um, so in 93, I switched my campaigning focus to disability. That was about access, inclusion, and equality. And I'm, at that point, I became part of the disabled people's movement. In 95, I got my first job as a user development worker, user group development worker, and that's kick-started a 20-year career working in disabled people's organisations. So really, the reason I'm here is because I'm a campaigner and a facilitator. I'm currently involved in disability arts and in Berkshire, where I live, Berkshire Disabled People Against Cuts. Um, I've had... In my career, I've had contact with the media. I've done bits of radio and TV um, and press releases and stuff like that. But not, not extensively, but I have done that. Um, and in, in more recently, interviews for Radio Berkshire on uh, the introduction of PIP. Um, so currently, my, my, my social media activity includes I've got a get inclusion so get inclusion is my kind of work uh, freelance stuff I've got a Facebook page get inclusion and a Twitter account this is just to let you know what I do um, and I'm also admin for a Facebook group Berkshire Disabled People Against the Cut and since 2011 I've been writing articles and reviews and opinion pieces and a blog for disability arts online so, human rights, social inclusion, social model of disability underpins everything I do and where I'm coming from. And since I'm facilitating this workshop, that's what we're going to do. Um, so I put here, key issues for media work are what stories, whose stories, and stories told by whom. And so, in other words, it's nothing about us without us. Does that make sense? Yep. What stories, you know, stories told by whom and, 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 and whose who stories. So that's me. I'm going to ask Donica. Donica DeLong just to introduce himself. Yep. Um, first point, particularly for the signers, give me a kick if I talk too quickly. I'm Irish and I do have a tendency to talk very quickly. Um, I'm Donica DeLung. I've been an online journalist since 1998. I originally worked for RTE in Ireland, which is the Irish National Broadcaster, on their website. I worked for six and a half years for Amnesty International. I've also been the president of the National Union of Journalists. 
and i now work as an online communication consultant working supporting people to improve their communications. so that's what i bring to this. i have a fairly fairly deep understanding of the media and say the parlous state of much of the media in this country at this point, but actually one of the points to talk about today is actually how that presents opportunities. um so if you know much about the decline of local media, the closure of newspapers um the lack of staffing in in newspapers, one of the things to recognize that is that local media in particular in this country is dependent hugely on what's called journalism and journalism is where you take a press release tweak it a little bit and print it and if you look at local newspapers but also large parts of the nationals that's what the content is the opportunity there is to do the same as companies do is actually not expecting the media to come to your thing because there's nobody left in the office who can leave and do any reporting but actually to become a news service yourselves write about what you do write about your campaign write about your actions get good quality pictures and send send them to your local newspaper the chances of them being published particularly on a slow day at news day are very very high <laughs> um and you just need to think about what does get covered in terms of disability issues in the media but even the right wing media even the mail or the express are individual stories so people who can't get parking even though they've got a blue badge because nobody's enforcing the parking spaces people who can't get a seat on the bus because there's people with problems locking up the media likes those kind of stories and they're not political they're not necessarily social model they're just about individual stories of where bureaucracy has fallen down and regulation has fallen down so dis disabled people's stories are told and if you look at those stories and look at where they came from it was largely the individuals themselves who gave those stories to the media the challenge is how to take it beyond that how to be plug into social model human rights and politics some places it's easy the mirror will cover that the morning star will definitely cover that but one of the challenges is how you take it beyond that how you get it onto the today program how you get the stories into guardian maybe but even potentially the financial times if there's statistics and figures get it into maybe the express because the express has just been bought by trinity mirror who own the mirror so we may see the end of the frothing right wing haste filled express and star and then maybe come something else so it's looking at how the media is changing and looking at the opportunities that they provide is one of the things that i want to kind of inject into this conversation okay brilliant thank you and um, may i introduce john pring of disability news service i know you um, you just want to hide in the group and be a member but you're an important part of getting our stories out there, John. Just yeah, say what you're well, doing. I, I run Disability News Service. We've been doing it for nine years. Um, some of you will know me, some of you won't. Um, so I, have, I run a website. Um, I usually run about eight news stories every week around independent living, equality, human rights, poverty. And I have subscribers as well. So some organisations, disability organisations around the country, use my stories on their websites. Um, some individuals use my stories to brief themselves. Um, three or four kind of subscribe that way. So that's what I do. Um, and I try and come to as many of these kind of events and some of the protests as I can. Um, but uh, there's only one of me, which a lot of my readers don't quite understand that there is just one of me covering the whole country. So it's quite difficult. But it's a niche and it does get the, the, the stories out there and they do get picked up. I've got a good relationship with Private Eye. That's something to think about. Private Eye are very open to stories about disability. Um, maybe I shouldn't tell you that because it will lose one of my sources of income, but it's, um, they are open to it. Um, well, if, if we do it through, through DNS... Oh, no, no, I don't, I don't mind. No, it's, uh, there's, there's, there's plenty of scope there. Uh, particularly the stories in the back, the, the kind of in investigative news stories they do. Um, they're, uh, they're quite into disability benefit maybe stuff. Maybe um, is it possible to do a different colour oh. for the pen? Just because it's not that clear to... to um, and they've, they've done some independent living stories as well, um, obviously quite into politics stories too. Um, I, 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 I've certainly noticed, um, I think Donica's right, that, that obviously the Mirror and Guardian um, 
Tara and, and the mayor, as well as the individual stories, I think the challenge will be to get those bigger stories about the issues out there rather than the individual human interest news stories. They're open to, to running the individual human interest news stories about disability. I think maybe not so much some of these papers about the issues, the austerity issues, um, the rights issues. I think you're probably all aware how little mainstream media coverage there was about the UN Convention, um, uh, the the um, the report they did a couple of months ago. BBC actually did cover it, um, and obviously the Guardian, I think the Mirror did, but the others it was as if it didn't exist. And that, to me, is one of the challenges, getting some of those big rights issues covered by the mainstream media. Mm -hmm. OK, I apologise for the pen. It's not very dark. OK, well, I mean, that sounds <coughs> like it. Well, there's two things I, well, I picked up. So, that, so yeah, rights, rights issues. Does everybody kind of... No, what we're talking about by a rights-based approach and, and rights issues, we mean human rights. And so that's, if we're looking at it from a social model point of view, that's about the, I guess, the, 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 big, the big picture, how, how things affect us collectively as, let's say, an oppressed group, as, an, as a marginalised group, and looks at the systems, uh, um, uh, uh, and so on, and attitudes uh, that determine how disabled, disabled people are, are treated. So it's a whole framework of thinking. So everybody okay with that? Mm -hmm. So, okay, you, you mentioned mainstream. I was going to ask you, actually, is it, uh, is it, uh, do we still, is the situation still, there's the mainstream media and, and what, alternative media? Is that, is that the case? Um, to a large degree, yes. The readership figures or the viewing figures for the Mail or the Guardian, the BBC, are still much higher than you know. You could, you could say London Live was alternative because nobody watches it. Um, <laughs> but actually, they probably cover these issues more. If you've ever switched over at six o'clock to their news program, it, they will literally have anybody if you can find a London <laughs> link on their news program. If you can get the people into the studio, they'll probably cover it. Um, in terms of the supposed alternative, some of it is very alternative. At the Canary, for example, very radical, very left-wing. They'll cover your issues. The problem with the Canary is that the fact that the Canary covers it means that all of the people who hate the Canary won't pay attention to the story. Um, so it can be useful, but it might not be. More closer to the mainstream is something like Huffington Post, still nowhere near as popular as you know the, the traditional mainstream, but it's global. Um, so a good story here will be viewable by people in the US because it will become part of their American foreign coverage. Um, things are changing. The big change is, is two ways. The decline of the traditional media, so the traditional newspapers in particular, their readership figures are going down and down and down and down and down. I mentioned the Express and, and Star. Nobody knows what's going to happen to those with the new owner. It would be very, very weird to have them in the same company as the Mirror, <laughs> yet totally diametrically opposed. I mean, what's going to happen with the Times and the Sun if, when, if Rupert Murdoch ever dies? Um, we don't know because he's the only one who cares about it. His children don't care about the newspapers, so they could go. So it is changing, but we are still in the situation where the, the outlets of the media that really define public opinion are still, to a large degree, the same titles we've always talked about. A little BuzzFeed are coming in a little bit, Vice are coming in a little bit, the Huffington Post are coming in a little bit. But if you get a front page story in the mail, it will be on every news broadcast that day and everyone will talk about it. Less so the mirror. Yeah, but that's hatred, sorry. Um, Carla uh, from the uh, East Midlands, that's like vitriol and, uh, you know, get them all out and that kind of um, feel to the mail. And that's what they're into. 
likewise with disabled scroungers in inverted commas. Not, not me, you understand, saying that. But that's one of my questions was going to be to, to, our, to just get some uh, participation going in here. Um, what are, what are the, uh, the, the key messages that we hear from <coughs> the mainstream media about disabled people? So what does the overall the mainstream media tend to say about disabled people? I mean, can I go around the room and ask? Geraldine? <laughs> I was thinking then um, you were talking about access. I was just saying um, to my colleague here, perhaps two thirds of our deaf community won't be able to access a lot of the uh, mainstream media. And that's a real issue because it's not in our first language, it's not in sign language, so it's not made available. So that's what we're waiting for. We want the news to really <coughs> provide that and we want it to actually happen. So for example, what happened recently, I think, um, to compare with America, Lex, for example, so there was a disaster um, on London Bridge or something, I can't remember what happened at that, the, the, the theatre bomb. So there was um, a policeman or a fireman, whoever it was, talking, talking, talking about all the emergency procedures. And in America, there was a t at the same time, another incident happened and they had an interpreter with the person in authority, so the deaf person got the news as it happened, not afterwards. So in Britain we have a massive lack of providing interpreters straight away, and that's really frustrating, because we get the news late, we find out late. So I obviously don't, I don't mind reading the newspaper, but I can do that, and I like to look at you know what's on the news as well, I like to keep up to date, but for most of our deaf community and the people that I work with, their English is their second or their third or their fourth language. So they're not going to get the information from the news that they need in their own language. They're going to miss out a lot of decision making, a lot of information that's out there regarding government policy, in, in, information about disability rights, information about everyday life. It's not there. They're not involved in decision making because of that aspect. And that's a, a major concern for me. Nice. And we were talking about different um, different ways of media, different, I'm thinking, you know, okay, different ways of media, but what about doing the news differently in itself? Think about putting it on an iPad. Our young people, you know, they use new technology all the time, or using Twitter. I don't really understand it, if I'm honest, but they use, uh, yeah, they'll put a tweet on. I, I, sorry, I really struggle to understand what that really means sometimes. But our deaf people would like something different to go with our community. Something in sign language. Yeah, absolutely. To link back to your point, you stole my idea, Geraldine. I want to talk about the American influence. Same minds think alike. Well, that's a good example. My favourite source of media is knowing what happens in the world at the same time as it's happening. So you hearing people, you know about world events, you know straight away. However, our deaf people do not know at the same time. So yeah, I can read subtitles. That does give me access. However, deaf people, as Geraldine has said, they may be using English as their second, their third, or their fourth language. Their first language is BSL, sign language. So they're missing information. Or maybe they're misinterpreting the information. So they see hearing people talking about it, they read it in the wrong way, and they have to be corrected. They think in one way, but actually, because the information's not done in their first language, they cannot comprehend it fully, so they make mistakes and misinterpret. Also, I'd like to mention I stood for MP in the most recent election. And I was extremely surprised when I announced that I was standing for MP, I kind of expected the media to contact me straight away to want to interview me. Wow, a deaf person, it's really important part, you know, communication with voters. But the first thing that they asked me was, do you have an interpreter? I said, yeah, yeah, I've got an interpreter. You need to organise that. So they asked to interview me, but then they asked me to organise the interpreter. The costs themselves were a barrier. The media obviously makes high profit, makes plenty of money. It's, the total costs are very small in comparison. But my information that I would be giving to the news outlets would be rich. The community information would be valid. So I'd like that to be stopped. I'd like some help, potentially, with being able to get out what I'd like to say and influence the communities out there for voting, especially at that important time. And back in the, back in the election, I just felt like it was a barrier. So we went to a live debate. Uh, this interpreter here was there to support me. Uh, BBC Radio organised the interpreters for me. 
I had I was struggling previous to that to try and uh, recruit interpreters. You know, asking the interpreters what to do. I, they're basically the radio was saying, we don't understand the role of an interpreter. We don't understand what they do. Right, look at the Equality Act. You need to provide me an equality, an equal access to the other candidates. I need two interpreters. Oh no, I don't have funding. I can't find it. That makes me become even more concerned myself, running for candidacy. I'm not prepared. Like when other normal candidates are prepared, they're fine. They're hearing. They can communicate in their own language. I'm stuck. Will an interpreter be there? It's, a constant concern and it shouldn't be. I feel like we really don't have equal access in the media. It really needs to improve, especially with deaf and disabled people. It doesn't matter what it is, if it's newspaper access, if it's a campaign access, if it's election information, it should be general, wide and accessible for all. Can I just add one short point here uh, about interpreters as well, please? Interpreters uh, for both and deaf and the hearing person. It's not just for the deaf person. You're not getting an interpreter just for us. You're getting a hearing, an interpreter for the hearing people as well. They're here for you, not just for me. My interpreter is your interpreter. It's not just mine. That's, actually, that's a really important point. Do you want Can to I just ask that? a question on that? Because there's something that I, I struggle with on my website. Um, obviously, right, stories about um, deaf issues and, and um, BSL stories. In order to translate each of my stories into, into BSL, it would probably cost me twice as much as my revenue. So I'd be bankrupt within a month. It makes me really uncomfortable to know that. Have you got any ideas as to how, is, is there any solution to this? Because it's really frustrating. Because I, I, mean, I was actually approached by a company the other week that does translation, and they were offering to you know, translate to my website's content, but I said, no, I put eight new stories on every week. I would have to try and get them translated within a day and pay for all that. And I suspect it would probably cost me a thousand pounds a week, I would think. I don't know, but certainly hundreds of pounds a week. And I just can't afford it. And I, have you got any ideas at all? Hmm. It's a real challenge. Gosh, I don't think there's any real way to achieve that. And that's the problem. Hmm because people need to think about communication predominantly, so they need to think about the cost of communication and the costs involved for any access. So it should be worked out into a budget, but obviously if you talk to people about fundraising for projects and activities and things like that and remind them, please, when you're applying for these budgets, please put interpreter funding into your budget. Uh, don't tell me afterwards, oops, I forgot incorporate it into the funding bid, make it part of your plan. I read your uh, your news as well, and I've got real sympathy. I don't have an answer for you, I'm so sorry. I, it's a financial issue that's always going to be there. For me, if I go back and link with my election campaign this year, so which all of our, which sorry. Was it? I'm just wondering what part it was who could not um, give um, support, sorry. <laughs> Um, so, for example, my local newspaper, the BBC, Radio 4, uh, the university, media, all these various aspects, about 10, ten different organisations I had issues with, they always say the cost of the interpreter is too high. And I'll say, no, that's part of my campaign, it's something that I need, I have a right to express my communication needs and basically influence my voters, have, you know, the candidates have an opportunity, they can vote for them, but I didn't feel I had the equal opportunity for them to vote for me. So also, I've noticed myself, when there's a campaign, sorry if I'm going on, there's a campaign happening, the media will make films of the campaign in, in progress, and they'll have an interpreter there for the deaf person, that's fine. People will look and they'll say, oh, that's great, and there's a voiceover for the hearing people in order for them to access the deaf people signing. But then they'll film other people. There won't be any access. And we're always fighting each other because we, we don't know what people are talking about. So, for example, if they're filming a hearing person, they won't have an interpreter interpreting for us to understand what they're saying. So that's what our community are fighting for, for sign language access. I created my own subtitles for my videos because I wanted accessibility for hearing people. I, but why isn't it the other way around? Why don't you think right. it I, I, I'm really glad you raised this because it's easy for us hearing people to, to to forget and I'm I'm really it's it's awful that you have to raise it but I'm glad that you did and it feels like there's a com a campaign there in itself and certainly I think it running integral uh, to all our 
media work or access issues to you know different impairment groups. So I'm really glad you you, you did that. Okay. Okay. Somebody here wants to say something. Can um, I, okay. Um, me? The lady, me? The, the woman. Jan first. Me. Jan. Okay. Uh, um, just sorry, to say, I'm no, really no. sympathetic with the um, yeah. interpreter issues because it's a little bit the same with visually impaired people not yeah. having audio description on things and and things happening. In, and it's no voice necessarily speaking, or that you you only get say some of it. Okay. So that's another thing of having audio description. And sometimes people have, uh, I've noticed on the media, they, they put subtitles on, which is great, and they should. But then they don't have audio description as well. Right. Yeah. Okay. I think um, one of the things... Just this, on, this, oh, sorry. I've got a new name. Yeah. 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 Um, no, no, the man in front of you was oh, having that. Well, yeah. Um, I'm going to sound a bit harsh, but um, what, I first of all say hi, my name is Mike Lambert. I worked in education most of my life. I'm, I write some, do some freelance journalism now for The Guardian and the BBC. And I did a piece in The Guardian on the, uh, UN, on the UN convention. Um, and what we're actually been talking about now is accessing the media. Um, the notice on the door says using the media and I'm assuming that we're all here mostly because of the outrage that happened in the summer with the UN and how we can get that onto the media and um, how we can publicise other things that people may be discussing in other rooms at the moment. Okay, well, let's, let's do that. Well, that uh, was behind. Yeah. Um, Sorry, yeah. Could we, could we not think in terms, I, mean, I don't mean just us in this room, could it not be thought of in terms of coming up with a budget and then, um, obviously based on the correct pay scales and so on for interpreters, and then have the budget pulled so it would, there wouldn't be that immediate crisis. After all, if the UN can do that part of it, I mean, I know some countries grudgingly give money to the UN, look, um, you know, notably America, but it, it, in the spirit of the Equality Act, if that could be put forward and, put start, forward to and started, well, just among the, among, among the media and not as a volunteer. Oh, okay. All right. So um, that's an access to and not, the and media not, issue. And not in, not in the sense of a voluntary code, because that's too woody. And okay. Can we park that one a moment? Because oh, clearly access to the media is, is important, but we need to get on to what are the, what are the stories we want to see yeah. the media cover? So... So I'm going to propose that we talk about the UN Convention and the, new, the report. Does everyone know what that was? So, uh, does anybody want to s say what, what, what the, the, the report from the, the UN was about? What it said? The phrase human catastrophe? So who wants to just briefly say what the story was there? And the fact that it... So it clearly didn't get picked up by much of the mainstream. I had a hard job getting anybody, even in the Labour Party, interested. Certainly my local Labour Party website refused to put it on on the website on the basis that it wasn't a local issue. So <laughs> that is, it's, it's actually hard. Sorry, I didn't get your name. Is it John? What was your name, the person who last spoke? Well, my name. No, sorry, the person bit in front of you. So Mike. Mike, do you want to? So you you said you were involved with the UN. Report. Well, I wrote a piece about it. Yeah, I mean, I, I, was that for publication? It was in the Guardian. Yes. Okay. Um, I mean, it, it was just. I mean, I, I just assume that everyone in the room knows about it because that's what was spoken about in the opening. Um, Can you just briefly say what it was then? It was a, a, a periodic. Uh, since we signed up to the convention, we're uh, open to 
periodic inspections. This was our first one in 2017. I think we originally signed up in 20, uh, 2008, 2009, I can't remember. But it's the first one we've had. And it was damning in just about every area. Um, I think that the UN had a very hard time really uh, dealing with it, that an advanced country had such a regressive um, uh, you know, pattern of behaviour. The, the government, they took about half a jet full of people to Geneva <clears throat> to tell lies and deceive and use far more effort than it would have taken to tell the truth. Um, I listened to all the six hours of the um, uh, questioning. It, it was, I, I felt, I'm not young or naive, but I felt actually quite shocked and bruised by the end of it. Just just the kind of depth of uh, um, lying and subterfuge that had gone on. And the government has swept it under the carpet. They had, um, so others in the room they may know more about it than me, but they had half a day on a, a Friday to discuss it. I mean, it's just an outrage that it should be swept aside. And all of this came on the back of uh, a, a kind of one-off case that happened at the end of last year when the, um, the benefit system was put under scrutiny and uh, grave and systematic violations of human rights were discovered. Uh, Damien Green, our, um, uh, was he now? First Minister, so second in charge of this country, uh, criticised the UN for its old-fashioned and patronising attitudes to disability. Um, what else can you say? I mean, it's just um, too shocking. So I think it's it's like I think what we're here for today is to try and seize this, you know, th thing that's been happened and, and dropped really. And try and get that back into the, um, you know, into into the media and the people's attention. And one thing I, I positive idea I do have about it, um, the trouble is with writing anything for papers is that it has to be newsworthy. You can't just roll up and say, you know, I'm feeling angry or disenchanted about X, Y, or Z. Um, and that if we organise events, for example, I was in the in, in, um, education group this morning, that my suggestion was that we would have a day of kind of uh, coordinated action about it. Because in that way, you're actually creating an event that you can then go to the papers and say, yeah, would you like me to cover this event? Um, so, I mean, I think that whatever... I, I, I think what goes on in this room should, in a sense, be servicing what's happening in the other rooms. If somebody decides they want to have some uh, street protests or civil disobedience or whatever, um, then I think the, the best we could do would be to try and be in a position to serve that, to, to coordinate very quickly and um, get it out to people who are interested. So, isn't the problem though that the main, I mean, a lot of the mainstream media just won't cover those protests? I mean, they don't, they don't mm. cover Deepak protests. They just, they just don't cover them. They I mean, they, they, no matter how many protests, you, unless you get you'd have to get probably 15,000, 20,000 people on the streets. And as we know, that's just not going to be possible because I people support me. do. Uh, but um, but I, mean, I, know, I agree. I mean, a lot of um, coverage for its, its work, but it, it's gone beyond just lining up thousands of people, which in the case probably we'd have difficulty doing. Yeah. But perhaps we can think of very artful things to do. Mm -hmm. um, okay. That would be my suggestion. Well, so, um, Things have shifted a little bit from the kind of high point of protest in 2011, 2012, where actually there was so much stuff going on that the media covered very little of it. Um, in so, some interesting exceptions, so for example, the right-wing press covered a lot of UK and cut um, things, particularly when they defended libraries or health services, because they knew their audience. And the readers of the mail care about things like libraries and the health service, so actually the mail covered them. I think it's different, because I, I saw quite a lot of coverage on the pollution protests last week, which surprised me, because it's the kind of thing that five years ago wasn't covered. 
just make a point on the un and the difficulty of trying to get british media in the current context to cover it's always difficult to try and get mainstream media even alternative media to cover the un i worked for amnesty international for six and a half years the challenge is explaining the huge bureaucracy of the un in a way that makes sense to anybody uh, i remember at one point we were thinking for months about how to try and cover something we decided to make it a cartoon because we thought this is so complicated the only way we'll get people to pay attention is actually turning it into a cartoon the focus is not on the process and the procedure the moment you mention rapporteur forget about it you don't Most mention that you just you have to just dress up in a way yes. that is consumable that's why that's that, that's talking for a guardian audience yeah. that are fairly you know educated but yeah you have to condense things yeah but that, that's the challenge then when you're taught when the story is what the un is doing because then you need to explain it you need to talk about the process and currently in the post-brexit britain you've got a government who resents all international um saying you know, their attitudes to numerous un uh reports has been basically appalling unless they're criticizing korea yeah but anything about the uk they have taken the same attitude the brexit attitude to experts and interfering foreigners and that seems to be the government attitude which is then reflected in the mail it's reflected in the express so for trying to figure out how you can take the message of what the un says but actually try and detach it as much as possible from the un itself and make it about the reality of the situation it's, it's the challenge but that's potentially the way that you can get more coverage on it um, the UK, um, from what I can tell, is not just in systematic violation of the convention, it's media itself is very different from other countries. Even if you got into the media with some of these stories, it won't scarcely make a dent. I've got spreadsheets showing there's about 70 hours a week programming on UK Freeview TV on disability or the social safety net, not positive stories. On data walls, there's just disabled people. Uh, why hasn't that been challenged? It's on awards. And there needs to be, a, at least in my opinion, a two-hour documentary just explaining to the British public why advanced economies have a social security system. Because at the moment, this is one-way traffic, and it's not even a close battle. It's a massacre, yeah, yeah. I would say. Yeah. Okay. Obi. Yeah, I'm Obi, uh, uh, Occupy London and uh, uh, Barney Green Party. Uh, it's not actually about disability, but um, what we found in... In Barnet, as you said about the local media, is that they are they do want people to send them letters or to send them articles. So for us, actually, it's about um, air pollution in regards to say children in schools. The schools, unfortunately, didn't want to know about it, but the parents did because they, you know, the way that um, we are, uh, the schools, so the the borough itself uh, was uh, breaking the law, European <laughs> European Union. Uh, legislation about the uh, nitrogen uh, monoxide so we actually we could actually go into it that way and also about the, say the housing uh, so the local media is actually yeah, was interested in those because it's actually human issues uh, but yeah we had to actually make it really local so as you said about so, disability so, so should we switch to local then because that's it yeah it seems to be the case i mean like the one about the, the national i mean uh, I've been the, the recent one. Stop Desi. 100 peop, 106 people got arrested. Nothing on the media at all. No, there was nothing on the BBC, ITV, but Newham, the Newham recorder did cover it because it was a local issue. Uh, it was in the Excel. Uh, what was it called? Stop. Uh, so it was actually stop the war. Uh, yeah. We had the camp there for about two weeks, basically saying stop because we because the UK is the second biggest arms mm -hmm. export in the world, mm -hmm. which a lot of people don't even know. Uh, but then it was never covered by the mainstream media. But the Newham Recorder, as a local paper, did cover it. It's, so, it's the annual protest at the arms fair. Uh, uh, so that yes. every, every two years. We, we, uh, the, the UK runs the biggest arms uh, dealer, you know, like 10,000 terrorists and arms dealers come there every two years. So. Yeah. <laughs> Are there enough about disabilities within the news locally? If, it, if there is anything, it's more, mainly they're very negative. Mm. There needs to be positive stories. There are positive mm. stories. Do you want to say a bit more about how it's negative? But, the, but, they're, but they're getting money that they don't need, are uh, trying to get money from the government that they don't need. So those, uh, 
messages about disabled people being scoundrels. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, basically. Yeah. Same, okay. same, the same thing is happening in Barnet. It's, uh, it's a very, well, Tory council. So it's, like, it's always the case of saying, if you can't afford to live here, we don't want you here. But at the same time, so there's no faces of all of the people who will be affected by it. So, so I think as, as far as the um, press is concerned, I would be more interested in local news uh, because I think that has more impact on people in your area um, and maybe then sets an example in other areas. One of the things that came out in the United Nations um, report was um, about shared spaces. Now, shared spaces for disabled people are just a horror. They're driving us more and more inside. Now we've got scooters, and I agree, it's good that the children are actually using scooters and having some activity, but actually um, there needs to be some responsibility made by parents, um, making the children aware of other people on the pavement. But shared spaces with cars, it bars people with sight difficulties from actually going out into the environment. Their dogs don't understand what it's all about. They have no idea where they are. They can't see the lights if they are any, and these are all being taken away. And it comes out quite strongly in the in the report from the United Nations um, that the government should actually call a halt to shared spaces. And in London, we now have to negotiate. To get to a bus stop, we now have to cross a whole pile of cyclists cycling along at great speed in order actually to get to a, a bus stop or get off from a bus and get safely to the pavement. And I went to Whitechapel um, with um, some representative from the, um, I forget what it is, the research place um, down in Wokingham who were looking at these um, island bus stops. And they were horrified how dangerous it was for me to get across the road in my wheelchair. Um, and I think there are issues like that that we could take locally that might, they might be interested in more um, with pictures and examples. Do you mean the transport and road research? Do you mean the transport and road research? Yes, that's right. Yes, yes. Oh. They're doing, they were doing some research on it tonight down there looking at these terrible so were you saying uh, the using the report and picking out bits of it that we can use locally to kind of yeah. more uh, uh, make more relevant, uh, show how, how relevant it is to, to local people? That's kind of what you were saying. Mm -hmm. and, and, about. and it also it, it helps to change people's attitudes um, to uh, people who aren't disabled. You know, they, they, probably can hear a bicycle tracking along behind them mm. or a car and that's even getting more and more um, into the past hearing a car as we get electric engines um, but it actually makes more appeal if you can get local people that people actually recognize okay um, who are you uh, I, <laughs> I was just thinking you were talking about how the UN stuff is difficult. But the last reporting on the UN CRPD was on national news, wasn't it? BBC did. Yeah, I think ITV as well, if I remember correctly. It was on for a day or two, yeah. Yeah. But there wasn't I, anything, I think, I don't think that the mayor ignored it, the express ignored it. I think the Telegraph. Yeah, but I was and... even surprised that it got into the national news. Because, you know, uh, as Monica was saying, anything to do with the UN, they usually ignore. But this time, there was there was some reporting. But Not all of it was negative. What one thing I'll say is, for particularly for the public service broadcasting, which is BBC and ITV, because there was a negative response from the government, that meant that they were more likely to cover it because their political coverage is a higher priority than their international. So if the government had ignored it completely rather than slamming it, it would have gotten less coverage. <laughs> the fact that the government slammed it 
meant that researchers in the BBC and ITN read the report and then were able to use that to, and part of their public service broadcasting requirement is to explain what the issue is in the context of the political story. So I don't agree with that. I think that on the Thursday afternoon, that maybe it was the Wednesday afternoon, the um, one of the um, UN people just used the phrase human catastrophe. And that was what catapulted it into the news. It was like suddenly on the news, this phrase human catastrophe, that somebody had spoken out ahead of the actual publication of the report. It was like 24 hours before. And that was the thing that was picked up. I'm not sure about that. Um, I'm only interested in this because the CEDAW report is going to come out and hopefully that there will be more What's coverage. What's the CEDAW report? CEDAW's the short name for it is Bill of Rights for Women, but it actually stands for the Convention of all, Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. And we're going to be, we're going to be putting in a report for disabled women. We're part of the report. So hopefully that that would get uh, more coverage because we're going to build on what is being said in the CRPD report. To, to bring that back a little bit to, to the local media, mm. the political point is something that's always worth thinking about as well. If you've got, and there are now an increased number since the last election, a potentially sympathetic MP and you have an issue you want to flag up trying to get a quote from them as part of the work in advance that you're doing or when you send it in suggest that they contact the MP. Um, the reality is the people who read local news more than anybody else are MPs. They Often it's the only thing they know about their constituency. <laughs> they, they don't visit, they don't go out on the streets, but they will try and read what's in local newspapers. And every time the NUJ has a campaign to defend local newspapers, politicians from across the political spectrum will back it. Back when Boris was still mayor, he backed a major campaign to defend local media in South London. Because if you're a constituency MP, that's your main outlet as well. You know, if you're a, an MP, or you know, somewhere in the leafy agricultural parts of Britain and you have no role in the cabinet and you've got an issue, your chance is to have a question that the two hours into Prime Minister's questions, if you're lucky, or get it into the local newspaper. And then, once it's in the local newspaper, then you try and you send it to the journalists you know higher up to try and get them to cover it. So where you can plug something in, don't be afraid if you have an unsympathetic MP when you're writing up the story to put something in slagging them off. Because again, <laughs> if you can make the connection to politics, it's more likely to be A, covered, but also potentially picked up in political diaries, in something like Politico, um, and again, things like the Canary or others might pick it up where there's a specific link to the MP. So if you can find some. If you've got an issue and you can find that the, your MP either ignored it or was responsible for the thing that made it so bad, make sure that's part of it. So issues on their own definitely will get covered, but if you want to add some momentum to it, you do have to tie into the politics. And I'll just say on the UN thing, the reality is the BBC or ITN would probably have known 24 hours before that the, the government was going to slam the report, because you get pre-briefed on that. And that will have contributed to their decision to give to, to cover it because they've been given an okay. advance notice. It's hard to tell exactly on that day which was which led them to it, but you would have gotten people contacting people who, you know, from very senior campaign organizations or others going, This is important, you should cover it. And a note from the government that their official response was coming was going to come in twenty four hours with a fairly good idea of what that response was going to be. So you pre run the story knowing that the big political edge of it, which you'll discuss on the daily politics and on everything else, will be the next day. And I, I, if I remember correctly, it was discussed fairly substantially on the daily politics when the government came out with it. So all of those are connected somewhere like the BBC, they pre-plan a huge amount the, of stuff. The, the United Nations um, doesn't agree with some of that. They've asked the state party directly to do a mass media strategy and campaign 
with different target audiences based on the human rights model of disabilities. They're asking the UK government themselves to instigate something rather than individuals or groups. Yeah, they won't. <laughs> we have to wrap this up in a minute, and I, some, one of us, probably me, is going to have to tell the rest of the, the conference what was the, our big idea that we that we came up with. And it feels like what we've come up with is is that the UN, uh, the report, the human catastrophe, the grave violation, uh, a systematic violation of you know uh, of, of human rights. That report is an opportunity. For us to, if you like, localize and I don't know if these are words, localize, individualize, make it real, but 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 linking it. So if that feels like what what we've come up with, our big idea is to use that report. Is that is that right? So we don't even know, we don't have to go looking for the stuff to write there will about. There be updates as well. I mean, the the UN yeah, is going to be further progress yeah. reports and things. I think over the yes. Yeah. And I know, I, I know yes. two, two people, personally, who, uh, one guy lives in Norfolk, you know, uh, Vince Laws, probably, uh, and look more locally where I live, a guy called, called John Hargett, and he and I are involved in the campaign, and we've used those phrases, uh, the gross violation, uh, and, and certainly human catastrophe, I have keep ta uh, hashtagging human catastrophe, it doesn't get picked up. I also hashtag austerity kills and stuff like that. So we haven't even got into social media at the moment, but it feels like you know that that we want we could encourage people to to look at to look at that because we we do need to stress this human rights angle. Oh, yeah, difficult though it is. The other thing I would say, this is this is the if ever disabled people and disabled people's organisations, if there are any left, were shy about being political, now is not the time to be shy about political. You know, we're fighting for our, our survival here. Where, where is the regulator? Pardon? Where is the regulator? Well, the regulator? British, well, British media, they must have the independent press complaints commission, is it? Well, where is the <laughs> okay. that's a whole other story. Well, the, well there's two. The, there's one that has most of the right-wing papers, which is Ipso, which is a creation yeah. of the right-wing newspapers in absolute contravention of the rules of Leveson, and it is a classic example of a failure of self-regulation. There is another one which nobody has signed up to, but it is the official one. I can't remember the name of it. it television. Television is the... And uh, television, yeah, if you can find specific examples, you can complain to Ofcom or you can complain directly to the BBC. Whether that would get you anywhere or not but is, a, is another question. If you did it as a group, I think that needs to happen. Um... The, uh, particularly with the BBC, um, their official complaints process is individual license fee holder, not group. As a group, the BBC's move to uh, to um, Regent Street has made it very, very easy to have protests, which actually has made it then less and less impactful because everyone is doing it. There's a huge space in front of the building, it's accessible um, at uh, Oxford Street Cir Circus. I mean, in both ways, people can get there very easily, and as far as I know, the station is accessible. That means every other week somebody is having some kind of protest in that space, which has actually decreased the impact of protest uh, with the BBC. So it's difficult. But if you find, and never be afraid to just, if you see something appalling on the BBC, go onto their website and complain. They do count the numbers of complaints. So if you can organize a mass complaint. Um, Ofcom is slightly different. It's uh, more of a hands-off regulator than the BBC's internal system. Um, but you can, again, you can, you can complain if you see some. Ofcom covers all of the rest of the, internet, of the broadcasting media, so it covers radio, ITV. Um, I feel the outcome is.